Another day, another iceberg. Today I'll be looking at the Batman iceberg. And just for clarification, because I've been asked this before, all the icebergs I cover were created by me. I don't like covering other people's icebergs, so, you know, I make my own. Also, because I failed to explain this last time, icebergs are a way to represent trivia and information about a franchise. The top tier being the most well-known stuff about the franchise, and the bottom being, well, fake creepboss type stuff. But the one just above the last one are the least known about a trivia. Least known about trivia. Least known uh, trivia. So anyways, I hope you enjoy. Bruce Wayne. Why are you dressed up like Batman? Because he is Batman, you moron. Was. The Burdenverse is a term used to describe the 1989 Batman franchise. It includes, well, obviously, Batman 1989, Batman Returns, Batman Forever, and Batman and Robin. You're probably wondering why this is even on this iceberg, because, you know, it's just a series of films. But for some reason, some people just don't consider Forever and, and Robin to be canon to Batman and Batman Returns, despite the actors for Alfred and Gordon being the same, and there are plenty of references to the first two films in those two, so I don't know why people don't like the different directors, different uh, take on the character. But uh, yeah, they're the same franchise. Frank Miller, aka, holy shit, this dude's career went off the fucking bat, has stated that all of his Batman comics take place in the same continuity. So such classics as Batman Year One, which is personally one of my favorite comics, and The Dark Knight Returns, take place in the same continuity as Dark Knight Strikes Back, The Dark Knight 3, The Master Race, All-Star Batman and Robin, The Boy Wonder, and Spawn Batman. Yep, the Batman in Year One that's uh, responsible for this scene, same one that said, I'm the goddamn Batman. Sweet. Epic. Kind of reminds me when Ridley Scott was like, yeah, you know, Blade Runner's canon to Aliens and uh, Predator. It's like, why? Why, why would you... There's no need to confirm that. Stop. Just. So in today's installment of Pigpen's and Idiots, I didn't realize shark repellent was actually a thing. I thought the 1966 Batman film came out with it. Oops. Anyways, in said 1966 film, Robin hands Batman a can of shark repellent bat spray. Because of how extremely specific and silly it is, it's become a joke in the Batman franchise, with many different continuities poking fun at it. Batman Triumphant, which was actually called Batman Unchained, I don't know where Batman Triumphant came from, was intended to be the fifth installment of the Burdenverse and would have been massive. It would do with Scarecrow and Harley Quinn as the main antagonists, where Coolio would have played Scarecrow, but nobody knows who would have played Harley. Harley in the film would have been the daughter of the Joker and wanted to kill Batman's revenge for the death of her father. The film would have been darker and closer in tone than the first two films in the series, and would have had an extended Scarecrow fear toxin scene where Batman was confronted by Joker, Mr. Freeze, Riddler, Penguin, Two-Face, Catwoman, Poison Ivy, and Bane, all played by their respected actors. It would have been the most expensive scene in film at the time because of how much it cost to hire these actors for such a short role. But ultimately, the film was scrapped. In 2001, Andrew Kevin Walker pitched to Warner Brothers a film called Batman vs. Superman, while J.J. Abrams' Superman flyby script was on hold. The film would have taken place in the Burdenverse and would have connected that universe with the Christopher Reeve Superman universe. I guess by extension, Supergirl, but <laughs> less said about that film, the better. The plot was about an older, retired Batman who is saddened by the deaths of Dick Grayson, Alfred, and Commissioner Gordon, while Superman is upset after the recent divorce with Lois Lane. Batman then tries to get married, but his wife is killed by a clone of Joker, who has been created by Lex Luthor. Batman blames Superman for her death, the two fight, then the two team up to stop Luthor. Ultimately, the film is cancelled to focus on Superman Flyby, which then got cancelled shortly afterwards. The film would later be referenced in I Am Legend, where posters of the film can actually be seen. That credit card is a gag in Batman and Robin, and has been the source of many jokes on the internet since its release. Namely, his nostalgic critic, but we'll get to him later. There was a big controversy around Batgirl when the Killing Joke movie came out. Outside of weird fan service shots of her ass, many felt 
her having sex in the film right before being sexually assaulted by Joker was really disrespectful. I 100% agree. But then there's people who think that her having sex with Batman is somehow incest, but that's just objectively not true. Like, she has a dad. She's extremely close with Gordon, her actual dad. Her whole thing with Batman was just a teacher and student thing, which is still weird, mind you, but it's not incest. Whatever, I'm getting off topic. Point is... Sexualizing a character who's sexually assaulted in the film is not good. Don't do that kind of shit. I don't know what the fuck they were thinking when they made this. After the critical failure of Batman and Robin, Warner Bros. decided to develop a live-action film based on Batman Beyond. They hired the show's creators, Dean and Alan Burnett, to be the film's writers, and the director, Bose Yakin, hoped to cast Clint Eastwood as the elderly Batman. But the film was put on hold and eventually canceled. But hey, I guess we're getting a live-action Batman Beyond film now. Right? Probably? I don't know. Maybe. Just like how there's a Bizarro Superman, there's a Bizarro for every Justice League member, including Batman. Bizarro Batman first appeared in World's Finest 156, where he's known as the world's worst detective. He comes equipped with a useless belt, I guess it's the official name, useless belt, which is the same as Batman's utility belt, but contains nothing useful. Like old cigarette butts, used chewing gum, used bottle caps, Rusty nails, cigar ash, banana peels, etc. In Earth 22, Joker subjects thousands of the Gotham City citizens to the chemicals that transformed him. As Batman fights him, Batman kills Joker and is then exposed to a purified form of the chemical that turns him into a fusion between Batman and Joker. He's got Bruce Wayne's intelligence and physical strength, and Joker's twisted mind warps its humor. He then kills all the Bat family and recruits Damian Wayne into becoming a mini Joker and starts taking children and turning them into rabid Robin minions. He then travels the multiverse, got his own miniseries, and has become a recurring villain in the DC Universe. In 2015, Batman lost his memories and stopped being Batman, so Commissioner Gordon took up the mantle with an XO Batman suit. It's got night vision, a defibrillator, strobe lights, remote override operating systems, a vocal projection system, an audio defense system, cannons, rocket launchers, tear gas launchers, active camo, a cape-shaped bomb shield, and a bunch of other advanced warfare shit. Needless to say, I'm not exactly a fan of this. Batman of Zur NR, aka Lano? Is the T silence? Whatever. Is an alien who decided to become a version of Batman on his own planet. A pretty silly idea from the Silver Age of Comics. He first appeared in Batman issue 113 in 1958 before reappearing in the 2000s. But this time, completely different. He wasn't an alien anymore. He was Bruce Wayne. It turns out that Zur and Ah was a backup personality created by Bruce Wayne in the event he was ever mentally compromised. In this state, he's more violent and unhinged. In this state, he describes himself as being Batman when you take Bruce out of the equation. Gotham at Gaslight is a one-shot Elseworld story released in 1989. Set in 19th century Gotham City, in this, Batman must track down and take down Jack the Ripper. It's by far the most popular Elseworld version of Batman, and arguably the most popular Elseworld DC story ever. It was so popular, it spawned a sequel in 1991 called Master of the Future. This universe has also been revisited several times in 2008 and 2018. There's also been an animated film based on it, though it's not a direct adaptation as it includes elements of both the original and its sequel. So Composite Superman, aka Joseph Mech, was a janitor at the Superman Museum. Because, of course it's a Superman Museum. Because he was surrounded by mementos and artifacts from Superman's career, it made him bitter at the Man of Steel. Then one night, a bolt of lightning passed through an open window and struck a display, which released an energy blast that struck Joseph. He discovered he now had the powers of the Legionnaires, and used his shape-shifting abilities to turn his skin green and form a costume that was half Superman and half Batman. He would then go on to create situations for both heroes to handle, but he'd intentionally sabotage whatever they're doing in order to humiliate them. He was defeated, but have returned a few years later in 1967, in which he was eventually killed off. Batmite is a childlike imp and has near-infinite magical powers, and uses highly advanced tech of the fifth dimension that cannot be understood by humans. Batmite idolizes Batman and sets up strange, ridiculous events so he can see his hero in action. I personally cannot stand him, not because I think he's unfunny or annoying, I, I do think he's both of those as well, but I just don't think this idea really works with Batman. Besides the comics, he's appeared in the new adventures of Batman and Batman the Brave and the Bold. Joker, after convincing Mr. 
Ooh, I don't know how to pronounce that. I am not going to attempt that. Uh, he, he tricked a magical godlike imp into giving him 99% of his reality shifting powers, making Joker a near godlike entity called Emperor Joker. And it allowed him to create a hellish world in his own image. This story began in Superman one, issue 160 and featured Joker torturing and murdering Batman every single day, only to bring him back to life and repeat the cycle daily. Through some complicated magic stuff that I don't understand, time is set back to the moment right before Joker disrupted everything. Superman is forced to then steal Batman's memories so that Batman can go on living, because, I mean, you know, constantly being tortured, killed, and brought back to life is... I mean, you know, that's gonna break you. That's gonna... That's gonna hurt you a little bit. You're not gonna come back from that, are you? Side note, a much tamer version of the story actually occurs in Brave and the Bold as well. While there is a film where Batman battles Dracula, this wasn't the first time these two have faced off. A trilogy of comics were released from 1991 to 1998 written by Doug Munch. All of these were Eltron stories and were titled Red Rain, Bloodstorm, and Crimson Mist. It's pretty popular and has influenced some other stories. For example, the film I mentioned previously actually draws inspiration from the first two installments of the trilogy. Oh, and yes, of course, Batman does become a vampire in this series. Because they're both owned by Warner Brothers, Batman and Scooby-Doo have crossed over several different times. The most famous of them being the 1972 compilation movie, Scooby-Doo Meets Batman, where the Scooby game helped help out the 60s Batman and Robin stop Joker and Penguin. Thank Christ it wasn't Heath Ledger Joker, or Killing Joke Joker, or God forbid, Jared Leto Joker. Then, in 2018, they crossed over with Batman from Brave and the Bold. Honestly, I was shocked when I found out about this. I didn't, I didn't think that they would release anything for that series after its ending in 2011. I mean, is Brave the Bolt that popular? I mean, it's a, I'm happy it exists. I'm just, just, just surprised. In 2012, the comic Batman Incorporated introduced Batcow as a cow who was injected with synthetic hormones by Professor Pig to brainwash people. When Batman and Damian Wayne fought at the slaughterhouse before Batcow was sent to die, they found Batcow with a bat-shaped pattern on her face. Disgusted with the meat industry, Damien decided to become a vegetarian and adopted Batcow. So now Batcow lives with the Waynes. And even stopped a kidnapping one time. She has no powers, as far as I'm aware of. She's just a cow. Oh, and there's also been like a Joker cow? Or something named Lafa? I, I couldn't find anything about it. Like, I found images of it. But that's it. I, 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 don't, I don't know. It looks like a Joker cow. I don't know. DC, can you put Batcow in the DC? Oh, they... Oh, they are. Huh. So most people know about the Lego Batman film released in 2017. But what many people don't know is there's actually a bunch of Lego Batman films that have been released over the past couple years. Though they're not connected to the theatrical film or the Lego Cinematic Universe. They're much lower budget and made primarily to advertise sets. With entirely different voice casts, etc, etc. They're just promotional things, basically. Batman Darkest Night is an Elseworlds story released in 1994 and is written by Mike W. Barr. In this, Bruce Wayne becomes a Green Lantern instead of Hal Jordan, which obviously has serious impact on the DC Universe as a whole. One well, of the biggest examples is how he's able to prevent the creation of the Joker. In order to fuck with this new Green Lantern, Sinestro turns Harvey Dent into a supervillain with special gauntlets and Selena Kyle into a star sapphire. Oh, and Sinestro absorbs Joe's chill's memories and goes insane like the Joker. It's become a pretty popular story that's been referenced several times in video games. During the Flashpoint event, where Flash basically rewrites the DC Universe and does a whole big old reboot on the timeline, he travels to an alternate timeline where Bruce Wayne was killed by Joe Chill, and Thomas Wayne became Batman, while Martha Wayne became Joker. This Thomas Wayne is way more brutal than the main continuity Batman, to the point where he has no issue murdering criminals to get in his way. He's an extremely popular version of the character, and I personally cannot wait to see Jeffrey Dean Morgan portray him in- uh oh what about Lauren Cohan joke? Oh. Side note, by the end of the story, Thomas Wayne tells Martha about how Barry Allen, you know, Flash can, you know, reset the timeline and save Bruce. And when she finds out that Bruce grows up to become Batman, her arch emesis, um, she kills herself. So, you know, nothing, nothing happy happens in this universe. Nothing good happens in here. On a much lighter note, in 1957 Detective Comics issue 241, Robin gets hurt while saving a young girl, so Batman 
being the mentally sane individual he is, decides, hey, I'm going to start wearing bright colored bat suits from now on. He explains to Robin that while Robin was injured, he was worried that people would make the connection between Robin and Dick both being injured at the same time. So he dressed up in these vibrant costumes to bring attention to him, not Robin. And then decades later in Brave and the Bold, Batman creates a rainbow suit to battle a rainbow monster. All right. Okay. Kite Man first appeared in Batman issue 133 in 1960 and was a reference to Troy Brown because of his name being, you know, Charles Chuck Brown. And his thing is to fly kites while Charlie Brown gets his kites stuck in a tree. He uses kites to fly around and uses kite weapons to fight. Very obviously, this character has become a joke. Most recently, he's been a recurring character in the series Harley Quinn, and he was going to be in the Suicide Squad, but James Gunn said he'd been used as a punchy bag way too many times in the past, so he chose not to add to the pile. In 1954, awful human being Frederick Wortham claimed in his book Seduction of the Innocent that, and I quote, Batman's stories are psychologically homosexual. He claims that Batman and Robin are actually gay and are indoctrinating kids becoming gay. So are they? N no. In 2021, they did confirm that Dick is bisexual, but Bruce is straight. But then Burton Ward, the actor for Robin in the 60s Batman series, said in his autobiography that Batman and Robin could be interpreted as lovers. Then in 2006, George Clooney, the guy who played Batman and Batman and Robin, said, and I quote, I was in a rubber suit and had rubber nipples. I could have played Batman straight, but I made him gay. Despite parodies and weird homophobic people claiming Batman is turning kids gay, DC has stated that Batman is straight. I mean, I think it's pretty safe to say that he's at least bi, because I mean, the dude is banging pretty much every female character in this series, so, you know, he's clearly not strictly gay. I'm straight. Straight? Believe me. I have a subscription to Playboy. And look into my and look at my eyes, my face. I can't be more serious than how I am right now. Those damn slanderous trolls. Damn them all to hell. And another thing, you slanderous trolls. You can kiss my foot. <laughs> your favorite Kellogg's Pop-Tarts with Batman and Robin, Batgirl, and Mr. Freeze Sprinkles straight from Gotham City to your toaster. You can't elude justice. Batman is back on Country Network. Batman Death of Innocence is a one-shot comic released in 1986, where Batman travels to the fictional country of Creveria, that's in the middle of a civil war. One thing leads to another, and Batman's looking for a little girl named Sarah. When he eventually finds her, the two wait for a transport to help bring him back to Gotham City. While waiting, Sarah picks up a yo-yo off the ground. Only it's not a yo-yo, but a landmine designed to look like a toy. Despite Batman trying to save her, he can't, and she dies. This comic was released as a landmine awareness story in order to teach people in the United States the dangers and consequences of landmines worldwide. This comic also inspired two more DC landmine awareness comics, Superman Deadly Legacy and Superman and Wonder Woman The Hidden Killer. The story also helped boost your support for the international campaign to ban landmines, who, as the name suggests, wanted to get rid of landmines worldwide. Unfortunately, their cause was denied and, well, the dangers of landmines are still worldwide. Batman The Doom That Came to Gotham is a three-issue Elseworld miniseries released from November 2000 to January 2001. It's about Batman in the 1920s battling mythical and Lovecraftian enemies that are taking over Gotham after he accidentally reawakens the being known as the Lurker of the Threshold. 
It's a rather obscure Eldworld story and includes Lovecraftian versions of Two-Face, Ra's al Ghul, and even Green Arrow. You'd think this comic would be more well-known because of the Lovecraftian elements, but hey, I, I guess not. Superman Speeding Bullets is a 1993 Eldworld story created by J.M. Dementes and Eduardo Barato, where Kal-El, Superman, lands on Earth. But instead of Kansas, he lands in Gotham City, where he's adopted by the Waynes and named Bruce. During the mugging that kills Thomas and Martha Wayne, Bruce destroys, well, burns off Joe's chill's face and discovers he has superpowers, but is unable to save his parents in the process. The rest of the story is then essentially what if Batman had Superman's morality and powers. By the end of the comic, he assumes the mantle Superman after realizing Gotham needs an idealistic Bruce Wayne more than Batman. In 2019, it was uncovered that WB Montreal was working on a sequel to Arkham Knight that starred Damian Wayne as Batman. Nothing of the plot has come out for the game, but many pieces of concept art have been leaked, including designs for a new female Black Mask, because if you remember, the last Black Mask uh, died in a DLC of all things. A DLC that was promoted before the game's release that spoiled the big plot twist of the game. I don't know what they were thinking with that whole thing. That was very dumb. Poison Ivy, who's now somehow alive, Gorilla Grodd, and the single best Two-Face design in history. Please, someone produce this design in a comic or game, movie, whatever, I don't care. Don't let go to waste. Personally, I'm mixed on this whole thing, because I, in my opinion, I really don't like Damon Wayne as a character. But at least it'd be another Arkham game and not the Square Enix Avengers loot box game that might be Gotham Knights. I'm going to try to stay positive about the whole thing, but... I'm not liking how this game's going to turn out. Look, looking at things, it's going to turn out. Funny thing about Gotham Knights is that it's also being made by WB Montreal and features the Bat Cycle as a drivable vehicle, just like how in this Arkham game would have had a drivable Bat Cycle instead of the Batmobile from Arkham Knight. Over the decades, Catwoman's had some pretty great designs, and some good ones, and some bad ones, and some very bad ones. But everyone knows about her iconic original design, right? Well, no, that's not her original design. This is. First appearing in Batman issue 3, this design got quickly changed. So yeah, Catwoman was originally a furry. I bet you didn't want to know that. In 2011, DC tied in with Subway to make promotional comics where DC heroes like Batman would team up with famous athletes to stop crime with the power of Subway. Batman's story was pretty funny in a so bad's good way, but what's way funnier is Superman's, where he teams up with, um, Jared Fogle. Ooh, this hasn't aged well in the slightest. Bet DC wants to forget about this one. In the early 2010s, a Gotham by Gaslight game was being pitched by Day One Studios to THQ. It would have been an open world game and would have been a direct adaptation of the comic and you'd be using gadgets that would seem normal by today's standards, but impressive within the 1800s, like a flashlight. The game was cancelled when THQ went out of business in 2013, but hey, at least we got a Gotham by Gaslight skit in Arkham Origins. If you bought the season pass. In 1996, Marvel and DC crossed over and created combinations of some of the most popular characters, like the Huntress and Captain Marvel, Doctor Fate and Doctor Strange, Superman and Captain America, Iron Man and Green Lantern, etc, etc. So of course, there was a Batman one. Dark Claw, a combination between Batman and Wolverine. His arch nemesis was Hyena, who was a combination of Joker and Sabretooth. After this crossover universe ended the same year, we never got to see Dark Claw or any of the other crossover characters ever again. In Detective Comics 275, released in 1960, Batman and Robin stop a criminal named Zebra Man, but in the process of trying to stop him, Batman was exposed to lines of force that gave Zebra Man his powers. These lines of force changed Batman's costume and gave him powers. Basically, anyone that went near Batman would be thrown back violently. Thankfully for the Cape Crusader, he was able to reverse the effects and lose the powers. This outrageous design has become famous among Batman fans, even getting a Comic-Con exclusive Lego figure and an appearance in Lego Batman 3, Beyond Gotham. Batman Castle of the Bat is an Elseworlds story released in 1994, written by Jack C. Harris. In this universe, in 1819, Bruce Wayne tries to revive his father from the dead. 
Basically, it's what if Bruce Wayne were Frankenstein, well, Batman, or Thomas Wayne, is Frankenstein's monster. It's a shame nobody ever talks about this one. The art is outstanding, easily one of the best-looking Elseworlds stories I've ever seen. In 2011, scrap pages of art were released from Catwoman issue 3 in the 52. These pages were scrapped for, um, obvious reasons. In this scrapped storyline, Catwoman figures out Batman and Bruce are the same by kissing both of them, and then decides the best way to confront him about this is to drive to Wayne Manor and, uh, strip naked. Why anyone thought this was even remotely okay is beyond me. Like, don't get me wrong, Catwoman's one of the hottest characters in fiction. But why would she do this? This doesn't make any sense. It just comes across as sexist, in my opinion. In October 2008, a video game adaptation of The Dark Knight was cancelled. It was going to be an open world game where you could drive vehicles and perform various side missions, and the entire film's cast reprised their roles for the game. The game was kept secret during development, with Gary Oldman accidentally revealing its existence in an interview with G4. It was cancelled due to technical problems. The team behind the game, Pandemic Studios, would need much more time to finish the game, and because it couldn't be released in its December 2008 deadline, Electronic Arts cancelled the entire project. While this game could have been great, because of its cancellation, the Batman game rights reverted to Warner Bros, who went on to release Arkham Asylum. There's a great video by Unseen64 on Did You Know Gaming's YouTube channel about the game's developments in much greater detail. I'll leave a link to it in the description. Batman the Spirit is a one-shot crossover comic released in January 2007, written by Jeff Loeb, where Batman crosses over with the Spirit, a character from the Golden Age of Comics. In it, Batman's rogues gallery teams up with spirit villains to take on the two comic legends. Oh boy, where do I begin? Alright, so All-Star Batman and Robin was written by Frank Miller, and was written from 2005 to 2008. It tells the story of Dick Grayson and how he became Batman's psychic. It's become well known for being one of, if not THE, worst Batman story ever created. In this series, Batman calls Dick Grayson retarded, forces him to kill and eat rats to survive in the Batcave, and a whole bunch of other shit. Basically, Frank Miller turned Batman into a genuine psychopath. Not to mention the needless fan service ass shots of Vicky Vale and Black Canary, just really not necessary in the slightest. Batman and Robin then also nearly kill Green Lantern after Hal tells Bruce that his methods are basically insane. And finally, Batgirl is a young teen and gets arrested. Oh, and how could I forget Joker's tattoos? Oh, and how Wonder Woman wants to murder Batman. Yeah, keep in mind, this is in the same continuity as Batman Year One and The Dark Knight Returns. This comic was supposed to go on for 13 issues, but was cancelled after 10 issues. Batman Holy Terror is the first ever DC Elseworld story, and was written by Alec Burnett. This takes place in an alternate universe where the United States never left England which results in a dystopian, ultra-religious police state nightmare. But there's even some more really weird shit in this comic, like how Green Arrow was hung because they caught him publishing works by Isaac Bashfist Singer. Thomas Wayne and Martha Wayne were executed by the states because they were both members of an anti-government radical group who ran a clinic for victims of brainwashing. They also treated men and women who were the subjects of experiments to alter their sexual orientations, women who try to perform abortions on themselves, and prostitutes psychologically scarred by aversion therapy. Bruce then becomes a priest, finds a demon costume, and becomes Batman to fight the government in the name of Christ. This comic is insane, and, um, I don't know, I don't know how to feel about it. I really don't know how to feel about it. In the event Forever Evil, written by Jeff Johns, Batman has revealed to be keeping a yellow lantern ring in his private arsenal since this whole thing is like, I gotta be prepared for anything. Batman then has used this yellow lantern ring to bat on evil version of Green Lantern after the Justice League was presumed dead. He didn't wear the ring for very long, but it left a serious impact on fans. At least I assume it did, because the Snatcher Core Batman keeps showing up in games like Arkham City and Lego Batman 3. It's Ninja Time! From December 2015 to May 2016, a six-part Batman and Team T crossover comic was released to pretty good reception. So good, it got two sequels, each being also six inches long. While most people know this crossover, pretty much for the, uh, the meme that came out of it, many don't know that this trilogy wasn't the only crossover between the two franchises. From November 2016 to May 2017, a six-issue miniseries involving the DCAU version of Batman 
Then you got like the 2012 Nickelodeon Turtles in Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures was released. Then in 2019, a film adaptation of the first crossover comic between the two was released, though the plot of the film is quite different from the comic. And finally, in 2018, all four of the Ninja Turtles were released as DLC for Injustice 2, where it's established that in the Injustice universe, Batman's met with them before. Oh, and I guess if we really want to get technical, both Batman and Michelangelo appear in the Lego movie, though they don't interact with each other. Alright, so in DC's Black Label, which was simply DC stories targeted exclusively at adults, they released a three-issue miniseries called Batman Damned that serves as a kind of sequel to the 2008 Joker miniseries, which I'll talk about later. Anyways, the story caused some controversy. What kind? They show Batman's dick. No, seriously, they just full-on show his dick. Because of the controversy, DC removed the nudity from future printings of the comic and began to quote-unquote, rethink who they are as a company. They even halted development of other Black Label titles in fear of a repeat. I was going to make a joke here, but the fact that DC thought this was a good idea in the first place is funny enough. Batman White Knight is an eight-issue series written by Sean Murphy from October 2017 to May 2018. It's about Joker becoming sane and reformed as he tries to take down Batman through politics because he views him as the greatest villain in Gotham City and the source of the city's endless crime cycle. It's a really interesting alternate universe that spawned two sequels, Batman and Curse of the White Knight and Batman White Knight Presents Harley Quinn, and a prequel titled Batman White Knight Presents Von Freeze. Side note, by the end of the first sequel, Batman and Harley Quinn are in a romantic relationship. And look, I'll be real, I'm a pretty big fan of this ship. I'll be real, I am. I'd go into further detail with the plot details of White Knight, but I don't want to spoil the whole thing for you, because it's pretty recent, and it's really good, you should check it out. There's way more Batman crossovers with the Alien Predator universe than you think. There's Batman Aliens, written in 1987 by Ron Mars, Batman Aliens 2, released in 2002 and 2003 by Ian Edgington, Batman vs. Predator, released from 1991 to 1992, written by Dave Gibbons, Batman vs. Predator 2 Blood Match, released from 1993 to 1994, written by Doug Monk. Batman vs. Predator 3 Blood Ties, released from 1997 to 1998, written by Chuck Dixon. And finally, Superman and Batman vs. Aliens and Predator, released in 2007, written by Mark Schultz. Despite the reception to a lot of these comics being... They're okay, at best. They're pretty popular in both fan bases, simply because the idea of them are, is so cool. It's so popular that in 2019, exclusive Comic-Con figures of multiple characters from these crossovers have been released. The Penny Plunderer is one of Batman's most goofy villains over the years. His first appearance was in World's Finest Comics, issue 30, in 1947. His real name is Joe Coyne and began his career selling newspapers. But he was caught stealing pennies, so now he commits crimes centered around pennies. His most famous crime was when he left Batman and Robin in a death trap shit like a giant penny. His lasting legacy is that of the giant penny that's in the Batcave that Batman keeps as a trophy of defeating this dangerous foe. Though sadly he's been retconned out of Batman's rogues gallery, and even his giant penny has been retconned into being an item that Two-Face used to try to kill Batman. His last appearance in mainstream DC Comics was him being on death row. What the fuck did Penny Plunderer do to deserve being on death row? Oh wait, there was the alternate timeline, Scarecrow Two-Face Year One, where Penny Plunderer makes an appearance but gets crushed to death. Guess he did get the death penalty. Orca is an eco-terrorist villain who first appeared in Batman issue 579 in the year 2000. After an accident left her crippled, Dr. Grace Balin experimented with spinal cord tissue regeneration using Orca tissue. This resulted in her being able to transform into a weird creature that kind of resembles an Orca. However, after fighting Batman several times, she took more of these chemicals to get stronger, which resulted in her now being permanently stuck in her orca form. She's a rather new weird Batman villain, who's even managed to appear in the Lego Batman movie, and in the Injustice continuity. Granted, only in the comics, but hey, it's still canon. I think? But yeah, I think. Anyway, she's also formed a romantic relationship with Killer Croc in the Injustice universe. Even having a baby. Oh boy. Batman Earth-1 is a series of graphic novels written by Jeff Johns that take place in an alternate universe that's way more realistic than the mainstream DC continuity. Sounds like a pretty standard alternate universe, right? Well, then there's the release dates. 
Volume 1 was released on July 4th, 2012, and the second on May 6th, 2015, with the third volume being set for release in 2018, but then was pushed back three years, so now it's being released on June 8th, 2021. It was pushed back so far because DC pushed Jeff Johns and artist Gary Frank to work on the DC Rebirth event and Doomsday Clock, the kind of sequel to Watchmen. Despite the long wait for the third installment, Earth One has impacted Batman in many ways. For example, Jeremy Irons' portrayal as Alfred in Batman v Superman and both Justice Leagues is based on Earth One's Alfred, while in Arkham City and Origins featured the Earth One bat suit as a skin. And finally, the upcoming film The Batman is heavily inspired by Batman Earth One. Beware the Batman was a cartoon that ran from July 13th, 2013 to September 28th, 2014 that aired on Cartoon Network for only four months. After those four months, the show was put on hiatus until the remaining episodes were released on Adult Swim's Toonami programming block. The show featured less-known Batman villains as Anarchy, Magpie, Tobias Whale, Mr. Toad, Bosphorus Rex, etc. Oh, and also Katana. Yes, that Katana. This is Katana! She's got my back! She can cut all you and have with one sword stroke, just like mowing the lawn. I would advise not getting killed by her. Her sword traps the souls of its victims. Works under Batman as his sidekick and Bruce Wayne's bodyguard. The show was instantly hit with controversy due to promotional art that was not intended to be released, being, well, released, that had Alfred firing off guns. The team later clarified that the poster was just made to make the show look more exciting. Alfred didn't actually go around with a gun throughout most of the show. However, after the show's final episode airing, the show never aired again leading to the show becoming kind of obscure to the Batman fanbase, despite there being a tie-in comic series released. The reasoning for this is because Cartoon Network declared the show a financial failure and decided to write it off. In 2012, Chris O'Donnell, the guy who played Robin in Batman Forever and Batman Robin, confirmed that a Robin spin-off film set in the Burdenverse was considered by the studio, but was cancelled after the reception of Batman and Robin. Calculator, aka Noel Cutler, the supervillain that's fought Batman several times. While being redesigned at the present day to look more serious, the original version of the character looked like this. He first appeared in Detective Comics issue 463 in 1976. His powers were that of technopathy and cyberpathy, meaning he could use the internet without a computer and manipulate machinery with his mind. His costume features a button that somehow analyzes the powers or tactics of a hero defeating him, so he can dread himself from being defeated by that hero ever again. He's actually made quite a few appearances outside of the comics, appearing most prominently in Arrow. He's also appeared in Brave and the Bold, Justice League Action, and the Lego Batman movie. For the fourth season of Batman the Animated Series, the artist changed pretty much everyone's designs. Co-creator Paul Dini said the changes were made to look more like the Superman Animated Series, but to also experiment and refine some things. And of course, new designs mean new toys. Personally, I love the Batgirl and Scarecrow redesigns. These two probably my favorite versions of the characters, period. The Poison Ivy looked alright in my opinion. The Pale Skin was kind of weird, but it's not a big deal. The only ones I actually hated were Baby Doll, Bane, Riddler, Joker, and Catwoman. I cannot stand any of them, especially Riddler and Joker. Then there's Mr. Freeze, Mad Hatter, Clayface, Alfred, Gordon, Bullock, Penguin, etc. That just look fine to me. And of course, my wife Harley Quinn's design never changed because, well, she's perfect. Batman Nine Lives is an Elseworlds story released in 2002, written by Dean Motter. The story takes place in 1940s Gotham City and isn't a superhero story, but instead a detective comic from the same era. Batman's villains in this, instead of looking crazed and insane, just kind of look like normal people for the most part. In this story, Private Detective Dick Grayson is accused by Commissioner Gordon of murdering Selina Kyle, who instead of being Catwoman, owned the Kit Kat Club. Oh yeah, and there's also sewer gators in this, which is pretty funny. There's so much to talk about here. I'd highly recommend watching the Super Void Cinema's amazing video on the subject for more details on it. The short version is this. In 2015, Ben Affleck was in talks to direct, star, and co-write a standalone Batman film with Jeff Johns set in the DCEU. However, in January 2017, he stepped down from directing the film, so Matt Reeves took over in February of the same year. Many still were expecting Affleck to star in it, but under Reeves' directing, the film's ties to the DCU were completely dropped, and Affleck was replaced with Robert Pattinson. This film went on to become The Batman, which is scheduled for next year. 
The original DCEU version of this film was actually teased in the Snyder Cuts, where Deathstroke was planned to be the main villain and would attempt to ruin Batman's life as revenge for the death of his son. He also knew Batman's identity thanks to Lex Luthor, and the DCEU versions of Batgirl and Riddler would have made their debut. Some fresh gear. Slide in your ride and jet for a super break. There's a new hero in the house. McDonald's superhero burger. It's going on with tomatoes, lettuce, three juicy all beef patties, American and Monterey Jack cheese, all on a hero bun. Hurry, it won't be here forever. So drop in to Mickey D's for a real break. This taste of the month is mad fly. Have you had your break today? For freedom is eternal vigilance. Batman is back. Batman Houdini, The Devil's Workshop, is an Elseworlds story released in 1993, set in 1907, where Joker is kidnapping children. And Batman, well, of course, needs to stop him. However, he gets help from Harry Houdini, where he learns a ton of his skills fighting crime from studying Houdini's work. This comic also probably has one of the most terrifying Joker designs. Reminds me of the Smiling Man Urban Legend. Batman Gotham Noir is an Elseworlds story released in 2001, written by Ed Brubaker. The story takes place in 1949 where Gordon's the main character. And as the name suggests, it's a classic noir tale of Gordon being framed for murder by a corrupt mayor. It's a pretty solid noir tribute, but what's interesting is that in 2017, DC Comics partnered with TCM to promote the cable network's Noir Alley programming block. Because of this, DC published a free comic titled Batman Noir Alley, which involves Batman and TCM host Eddie Muller solving a crime together. After the story wraps up, Eddie Muller breaks the fourth wall and introduces Gotham Noir, as the remaining 14 pages are actually the first 14 pages of Gotham Noir. Batman Hellboy Starman is a two-issue crossover between Batman and Starman at DC Comics and Hellboy of Dark Horse Comics. Released in 1999 and written by James Robinson, the story is about a Golden Age star by being kidnapped by neo-Nazis while giving a lecture on alternative energy sources. In response, Hellboy and Batman team up to save him when they're joined shortly by Jack Knight, the new Starman. Batman then leaves to go fight Joker, which leaves the second issue pretty much just being Hellboy and Starman battling Nazis in the Amazon rainforest. The Cruel Way of Dying is a story featured in 1983's World's Finest, issue 289. In this, Batman and Superman come into contact with these weird alien worms after Superman takes them off a meteorite that was going to hit the Earth. These weird worms things start to then attack the two heroes, but are quickly defeated. When asked what they are, they say that they were created by the Krill, an alien race that needs to leech off emotions from people on Earth to enable themselves to die. These worms have never felt emotions before, and after taking a little bit of Batman and Superman's emotions, they learn the meaning of life and death. So they kill themselves, uh, to avoid their race from hurting Earth. So Batman and Superman then cry, realizing they just watched as a bunch of worms discovered sentience, and then just killed themselves. Comics in the 80s were fucking wild, man. Batman Child of Dreams is a manga written from 2000 to 2001, with the English version being released in 2003. In this story, Batman travels to Tokyo to locate the source of a deadly drug after it runs rampant in Gotham, turning people into shape-shifting beings who take the form of many of Batman's villains. But in Tokyo, he gets help from Japanese journalist Yuki Yagi and defeats the mastermind behind the drug. While not the strangest Batman story, it's notable for being one of the first Batman manga to be officially released in the West by DC. Back in the 90s, Batman and Spider-Man had two crossovers, the first being 1995's Spider-Man Batman Disordered Minds, written by J.M. Dementes, where Joker and Carnage meet each other when a psychiatrist attempts to use the two as test subjects to cure their murderous minds. Obviously, this doesn't work, and the two team up to kill some people, but then realize that their differing methods of murder don't mesh well, and so they turn on each other. Batman and Spider-Man then team up to defeat the pair. A direct sequel to this would be released in 1997, Batman and Spider-Man New Age Dawning, in which Ra's al Ghul and Kingpin work together to take over the world. Well, kinda work together. Ra's al Ghul infects Kingpin's wife with cancer and promises to cure it if he teams up with them. After defeating the pair, Batman and Spider-Man gave his wife the cure from Talia al Ghul. The Ten-Eyed Man, aka Philip Breeden, 
first appeared in Batman issue 226 in 1970, in which he was a former U.S. soldier who was fighting in Vietnam until he was honorably discharged after a grenade fragment hit him between the eyes. After some more accidents back home, he was left permanently blind in both eyes, until he was given his sight back when Dr. Engstrom reconnected his optic nerves to the sensory cells in his fingertips, allowing him to see through his fingers. Yes, this dude can see through all ten of his fingers. He was originally defeated when Batman put his hands into a mud pool, which of course blinded him. Strangely enough, though, this character has actually appeared in, in modern DC comics. Like in the New 52, when he tries to sacrifice a woman in order to find out the doom that's coming to him. He's also appeared in Batman Brave and the Bold. Batman Ninja is an anime film released in 2018 in which Batman, Catwoman, Alfred, Nightwing, Red Hood, Robin, Red Robin, Penguin, Poison Ivy, Deathstroke, Two-Face, Harley Quinn, Bane, Joker, and Gorilla Grodd all get sent back into feudal Japan. It's a crazy action film that has its characters designed by Takeshi Uzaki, the creator of Ephra Samurai. But the weirdest part of this whole movie is that when it was released in the United States, writers Leo Chu and Eric S. Garcia admitted to rewriting the entire film from the original Japanese script. So there's technically two entirely different versions of the same film. Just one of them is in English, while the other one's in Japanese. Gotham City Imposters was the first person shooter set in the Batman world, released in 2012. It was a hero shooter like Team Fortress 2, Overwatch, and Quake Champions. It was never released physically, only through Xbox Live, PlayStation 3 Store, and Steam. Many people believe the concept of this game was inspired by the Batman Imposters from The Dark Knight, but in reality it was based on a storyline in Detective Comics issues 867 through 870 called Batman Imposters, in which imposter jokers run rampant through Gotham, which inspires imposter Batman to go up against the jokers. It's actually still playable through Steam, though good luck trying to find anyone still playing. Side note, when this came out, my dumbass 12-year-old self thought this was a canon to the Arkham games for whatever reason. While never being flat out confirmed by Telltale, Season 2 of their Batman game ended on a pretty big cliffhanger. So it's obvious that there was a chance that a third season was going to be made. A pretty big one. That is, until Telltale went bankrupt, destroying any chance of a third season. Though there was a black and white re-release of the first two seasons in 2019, so who knows, maybe we'll get it one day. In World's Finest issue 186 in 1969, Batman and Superman are sent back in time once they realize that a statue of the Revolutionary War General Anthony Wayne looks exactly like Bruce Wayne, and when the bus is destroyed and rebuilt, it resembles Batman. So they go back in time, and Superman saves a woman from being accused of witchcraft, which Batman is then rude to Superman, so Supes decides to frame Batman for witchcraft which leads to Batman's arrest. Superman takes control of the trial and sentences him to be burned at the stake. Oh, and Benjamin Franklin tries to save Batman, but is unable to, because of course he's there. Anyways, through some more shenanigans, Superman reveals he framed Batman because he noticed a demon possessing Batman, so he wanted to scare it away, but instead of leaving, the demon simply possessed him and turned him evil until they were able to use Kryptonite to free him. They finally learned that the woman who created the statue of Anthony Wayne was the same woman that they saved earlier in the story, and that she created it for Batman. There is nothing weirder than 60s comics. In other time-traveling Batman news, Batman The Return of Bruce Wayne, released in 2010 and written by Grant Morrison, is a six-issue miniseries that details the story of Bruce Wayne as he travels back to the present after being sent to the past by Darkseid during the Final Crisis. Bruce has to then overcome amnesia and history itself to retake his rightful place as Batman in the present. These eras in time he's sent to are Dawn of Humanity, with a bunch of cavemen stuff, Salem, again, the Age of Pirates in the 18th century where he fights Blackbeard, the Wild West where he comes into contact with Jonah Hex, thankfully not the live-action Jonah Hex. Wait, the story came out in 2010, and the Jonah Hex film came out in 2010. Was the inclusion of the Wild West setting in Jonah Hex just a promotion for the film? I don't know, maybe. Anyways, then Bruce is sent to the 1930s, and then finally he gets the present day. Look, I don't normally agree with people when they say they don't like Batman being part of the Justice League, and wish he just did his own thing, because I think there's some great stories with Batman in the Justice League, and I like his relationship with Wonder Woman and Superman and stuff like that. But when it comes to stories like this, I don't know. Not really a fan of this. 
Birds of Prey is a 13 episode series that ran from 2002 to 2003 that was loosely based on the Birds of Prey characters like Batgirl, Huntress, Black Canary, and Harley Quinn. Alfred even shows up a couple times. Huntress in this universe is also the daughter of Catwoman and Batman, so there's that I guess. It takes place in Gotham City a few years after Batman's abandoned it, and features the Huntress and Batgirl, now Oracle, taking up the mantle of fight crime. This show wasn't very popular in both reviews and viewership, but Ashley Scott, who played Huntress, reprised her role in the Crisis on Infinite Earths event in the Arrowverse in 2019. But, um, uh, Anti-Monitor ends up destroying this universe in that event, so, uh, cool. They're all dead now. Okay. Oh, and Mark Hamill played a live-action Joker in this. It was only a cameo, but still. Never thought he'd ever play a live-action Joker, did you? Gotham High was a cancelled animated series that reimagined Batman, the Bat Family, and his enemies as high school students in the late 2000s and early 2010s. The creators described it like this, and I quote, <clears throat> We all go through incredible changes as teenagers. Growth spurts, bad skin, a sudden instable need to uphold justice, and avenge your murdered parents. Well, that is if you're Bruce Wayne. As if being a freshman at Gotham High wasn't tough enough, Bruce and Samia and technological fascinations are taking their toll. Instead of spending his time studying, he's begun to obsess over an emerging personality trait, Batman. But under the watchful eye of his guardian steward, Alfred Pennyworth, Bruce is forced to put his intelligence to good use. Graduating high school. But given his classmates, can Bruce survive Gotham High? This idea would kind of be revisited in the DC Superhero Girls line. Um, and I'm happy this never happened. But at the same time, imagine if it did. I almost want to exist in that universe where it did. In 1943, a 15 chapter theatrical serial was released based on Batman and Robin. Many may write off this film as just the first Batman movie, and that's it. But it's not just that. It introduced many elements we know and love today with the character, like the Batcave or as it's called in the movie, the Bat's Cave, and its secret entrance through a grandfather clock. It also changed Alfred's appearance from a portly gentleman in the comics into a slim older man. The film's villain is Dr. Deka, who is a secret agent for the Imperial Japanese government. It's an entirely new character made for the film. It says there was this, this big thing going on in the world during 1943. I forget what it was called. Uh, it's it's in my tongue. He was written into the film to tie into that. Anyways, this serial would be re-released in theaters in 1965, and success there spawned the 60s Batman series. Oh right, and Batman in this film was a government agent. Thankfully, that part of his character got dropped. Bad Kid Begins is a 2015 documentary film based on the story of Miles Scott, a kid sick with cancer whose wish was to be Bat Kid, the sidekick to Batman. And once his wish was heard, thousands of volunteers, city officials, businesses, and supporters rallied to turn San Francisco, California into Gotham City. It's by far the biggest and most elaborate Make-A-Wish project ever staged. He then got to live out the role of a lifetime being Bat-Kid as he helped Batman take down the Riddler and Penguin. After they defeated the criminals, he was given the key to the city. And you know what the best part about all this is? Miles Scott, the genuine tank of a human being, beat cancer. What an actual legend. In the late 90s, a TV series about Bruce Wayne's early years before becoming Batman was pitched by Tim Achilles. A couple years go by, and a full pilot was written out, and an entire six-season show was planned out. Some of these elements included having Scarecrow, Riddler, Two-Face, Joker, and Catwoman appearing in Bruce's life prior to them becoming the villains we know and love. Superman would have also appeared in some form. The show would have also seen Bruce travel across the world from Gotham to China, France, South Korea, etc. to learn criminology, defense tactics, detective skills, etc. He'd also train with Deathstroke and Ra's al Ghul, would do illegal street racing, and would have a bunch of love interests throughout the show, like Barbara Gordon, Vicky Vale, and Harley Quinn. Looks like I'm not the only one that ships these two. A too long didn't read version of all this is that would have been basically Smallville, but with Batman filling in for Clark Kent. The show would ultimately be cancelled, but helped inspire Smallville, the Birds of Prey TV series, and Batman Begins. Despite reception to the pilot script online being quite positive, and there being multiple attempts at reviving the project, DC and Warner Bros. continue to refuse to greenlight it. Which, to be honest, I'm all for. I personally never really cared for Gotham or Smallville, 
just not really into the whole superhero universes before the superheroes kind of thing. So after Snyder fans harassed Warner Brothers for the Snyder Cuts, many fans began doing the same for 2016's Suicide Squad film, as Warner Bros. tampered with it heavily after the negative reception of Batman v Superman and the positive reception of Deadpool. And so the hashtag, release the air cut, was born. Chances are, th this won't happen. It has nowhere near the amount of support the Snyder Cut did, and Warner Bros. has flat out said they're not doing it, as recent as this last month. Maybe things will change in the future, but I doubt it. And look, let's be real here. Do you really think an extended cut of the film would fix all the Suicide Squad's many, 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 many problems? Probably not. Return to the Batcave, The Misadventures of Adam and Bert is a made-for-TV movie released in 2003 that tells the story of Adam West and Bert Ward, the actors for Batman and Robin for the 60s series, reminiscing about working on the series while going on a road trip trying to find the person who sold the 60s Batmobile. On their way, they meet up with both Catwoman actresses and Riddler's actor. It's a neat little tribute to the 60s Batman series, and I'd recommend it if you're a fan of it. In 1949, a sequel to the 1943 Batman serial was released called Batman and Robin, this time also including Vicki Vale and Commissioner Gordon. In the film, the dynamic duo take on the Wizard, a villain with an electrical device that controls cars. So the plot of Fast and Furious 8, I think. That's what the film was about, right? I didn't see it, but that's I, I saw the saw the driving car. That's what it's about, right? Whatever. Anyways, this series was also a heavy inspiration for the 60s series. From 2000 to 2002, a series of six commercials made by Warner Bros. to promote the use of the onboard car guiding system OnStar were released. They featured Batman taking on the Penguin, Joker, and Riddler with the help of OnStar. Alfred, Commissioner Gordon, and Vicki Vale also make appearances. Not only were there these high-budget commercials, but two comics and trading cards were released alongside a sweepstakes. The craziest thing was that these commercials actually worked, as OnStar saw a large increase in subscribers following the commercials. <laughs> this is how you exterminate a bat! <laughs> Batman, this is Karen Boyd from OnStar. I gotta signal your airbag went off. Should I send for an ambulance? Everything's fine. Send the police to Fort and May. I'll contact them right away. <laughs> He'll never learn. <laughs> Shortly after Joel Schumacher passed away on June 22, 2020, media outlets began reporting the existence of a Schumacher cut of Batman Forever. According to rumors, this version would be much darker and less campy than the original film, and would include scenes where Batman would fight a human-sized bat and would deal with Bruce's psychological issues. There would even be less Robin in the film, apparently. According to these rumors, there's about 15 minutes of footage that Warner Brothers cut from the film. Sadly, Warner Bros. confirmed that the cut does exist, but they have no plans to release it, and are unsure whether what, if any, footage remains. I doubt we'll see this, but with Val Kilmer, the guy who played Batman in Batman Forever, appearing randomly at the 2020 DC Fandom event, it seems that maybe, just maybe, we'll get it one day. Batman the War Years is a 2015 collection of classic Batman stories. These classic Batman comics are notable for being about Batman and Robin fighting in World War II. People tend to forget nowadays, but a ton of DC heroes, including Batman and Robin, fought in World War II. Apparently Batman didn't have a rule against guns here. Actually, wait, no, he didn't have a rule against guns at this point, did he? No, he didn't, he didn't did he? No. Imagine if they did this nowadays, though, like Green Lantern and the bombing of Libya or Wonder Woman, no harm, no foul, or Shazam, the capture of Saddam, or, uh, you, you, get, you get the idea, you get the idea. Superman at Earth's End is an Elseworlds story about Superman on a post-apocalyptic Earth in the future, where he's got a huge, giant minigun thing, and looks like Santa. Here he fights the clones of Hitler, and some Nazis, because, yeah, of course. But Pigpen, this is a Batman iceberg. Where's Batman? 
Well, in this story, the clones of Hitler have made a mutant Batman-like creature that contains all of Bruce Wayne's memories. But Superman realizes that this Batman has no pulse and doesn't breathe. But it's still alive. So he puts it out of its misery and then gets gunned down by Hitler. Superman then kills Hitler, but he's mortally wounded, brings the corpse of this mutant Batman back to Wayne Manor where he burns the corpse to make sure Batman's remains are never misused again. And then Superman walks into the fire and burns alive. Is this story well known? Yes. Is it liked? Oh, n no, n no. This comic has been known as one of the worst Elseworld stories ever, and it's pretty obvious to see why. But with all that being said, I love it for how insanely awful it is. Don't worry, this is the last time we'll be talking about Frank Miller. In 2006, Frank Miller started working on a Batman story that we set in his Batman continuity called Holy Terror Batman, in which Batman defends Gotham City from Al-Qaeda. Yep, can't see how this can go wrong. Wait, didn't I make a joke about this kind of thing like two topics ago? Anyways, Frank Miller said in 2007 that the comic was, and I quote, bound to offend just about everybody. How are you going to offend people by showing terrorists getting beat up? Oh wait, I know, stereotype all Muslims to terrorists. But that'd be silly, right? He wouldn't actually do that. Oh, uh, uh, Holy Terror was released in 2011 without Batman, and it was basically a flat out Islamophobic comic where they just go, Islam is the enemy. Stan Lee himself even called it corny, outdated, and inappropriate. Oh my god, the art. What the fuck are these? <sighs> Jesus Christ, I'm happy that they took Batman out of this. In 2007, it was announced that DC would be making a film called Justice League Mortal that would feature DK Contarona as Superman, Megan Gale as Wonder Woman, Adam Brody as Flash, Common, yes, the rapper, as Green Lantern, Hugh Keyes Bryan as Martian Manhunter, and... Army Hammer as Batman. Yes, that Army Hammer. And that one. Yup, and that one. Overall, the film was meant to start a cinematic universe that wouldn't be connected to the Dark Knight trilogy being released around the same time. The film had a completed script that would have been featured the characters battling the villain Maxwell Lord as he begins to turn the planet into his own personal army. For an entire plot synopsis and way more details on the film and its production, go check out Heaven Studios' amazing video on it. I'll leave a link to it in the description. Ultimately, the film wouldn't be made because DC didn't want to mess up what they had going on with the Dark Knight trilogy. Theorizing that if this film sucked, people would stop seeing the Dark Knight trilogy. Oh, and a little thing called the 2000-2008 Writers Guild of America strike happened. I think this film could have been alright, but sadly, it just wasn't meant to be. I think DC should release a comment based on the scrap script, kind of like what they're doing with that new Superman comic series It's a continuation of the Christopher Reeves Superman universe. We'll be right back. Right now, at Taco Bell, you can collect free Batman cups, like a free Batmobile cup. Or a free Batwing cup. Cups in all, free, with free refills and free cinnamon twists every time you buy a 32-ounce drink at Taco Bell. I want you to tell all your friends about me. I'm Batman. Now, back to our program. In 1997, a one-shot Elseworld crossover titled Daredevil Batman Eye for an Eye was released, in which Batman and Daredevil team up to fight Two-Face and... Mr. Hyde? Oh, okay. In this comic, it's revealed that Harvey Dent was actually friends with Matt Burdock in this universe at one point. The comic was written by DJ Chichester, and was a decent-sized success. Three years later, in 2000, the comic Batman Daredevil King of New York was released, written by Alan Grant. In this, they team up yet again to fight Ra's al Ghul and King Pit. Wait, Ra's al Ghul and King Pit again? They did that in the Spider- whatever. This one's pretty notable for being the last one-shot crossover between Marvel and DC to ever be released. In one of the dumbest controversies ever, when the show Batwoman announced that Ruby Rose would be playing Batwoman, people went after her because Rose wasn't Jewish like Batwoman is in the comics, and that she identifies as gender fluid, and that didn't make her quote-unquote gay enough. Then, of course, there were the grifters and dipshits going after the show because the start of woman, and that means it's political and trying to kill men. 
It got so bad that she left social media altogether. After the first season, Ruby Rose left the show and was replaced by a new original character, played by Javisa Leslie. Gee, I wonder if the same grifters and dipshits will be okay with a black woman starring in a show that they will not watch. In Batman issue 147, released in 1962, Batman's body gets turned into the body of a four-year-old, though he keeps the mind and strength of an adult. So in response, Batman goes, So Gangland is now calling me a baby. Well, I'll dress like a baby and prove to them that I'm still a crime fighter as Bat Baby. Only in the 60s could this happen. Anyways, they get Batman back to normal and Batman keeps the Bat Baby costume the Bat keeps the trophy because I guess he wants to like a constant reminder of the time he was forced back into the body of a four-year-old. What a fucking weird... I get, Batman's not really that mentally well, is he? Batman Dracula is a lost film released in 1964, directed by pop artist Andy Warhol. The film was created to be a homage to the Batman franchise, but it wasn't authorized by DC Comics, so it's an unofficial film. Since its initial release back in 1964, only about 40% of the actual film was uncovered thanks to the 2006 documentary, Jack Smith and the Destruction of Atlantis. Batman Tarzan Claws of the Catwoman is a four-issue miniseries released in 1999, written by Rod Mars. In this, Batman in the 1930s must help out Tarzan, of all characters, take down the two-faced mercenary, Finnegan Dent, who is in no way actually two-faced. Completely different characters, they're not the same, I swear. Batman Meets Godzilla was a cancelled 1960s Godzilla film and would have been a collaboration between Toho and Green of Productions. There were two story treatments for the film, one by Shinichi Sekozawa and the other by an unknown American author, which is available at the American Heritage Center in the University of Wyoming. The plot of the film would have had Batman and Robin travel to Japan after an evil German scientist claims to have a weather machine that he'll use to destroy Japan unless he's given $20 million worth of gold. But in actuality, he doesn't have control over the weather, but instead Godzilla. For the rest of the film, Batman, Robin, and Batgirl take down Godzilla and Finster. They use a mating call to lure Godzilla out and knock him out with bombs. Then the people of Japan vote to send Godzilla to space. Batman then scales Godzilla, plants a bomb on his neck, knocks him out, and then the Japanese government build a rocket around Godzilla while he's knocked out before launching into orbit. What a film. Suicide Squad Special Ops was a first-person shooter developed by Tailspin to tie in with the Suicide Squad film in 2016. You play as either Deadshot, El Diablo, or Harley Quinn as you battle the Eyes of Adversary, which is apparently the name of the mindless monster drones from Suicide Squad. I honestly didn't even know they had a name until this point. Anyways, it was taken down from the App Store. Honestly, probably shouldn't be on this iceberg, but I mean, there was a first-person shooter Batman-related game released in the last five years. I don't know, I think that's kind of weird. Batman and the New Robin was an unproduced cartoon series that was never announced. It began development in the late 80s and would have been about Batman and Jason Todd as Robin fighting crime. In 2012, Canadian artist Michael Thorner shared three pieces of concept art for the duo on his Flickr account. He said that Nirvana, the production company behind the show, lost the rights to Batman and instead focused efforts on their Beetlejuice cartoon. Then, three years later, in 2015, DC Comics co-publisher Dan D. Dio shared a promotional image of the series. Because it was never picked up, Jason Todd wouldn't appear in animation for decades until 2010's Under the Red Hood. So in 2012, there were rumblings of a Dark Knight Rises spin-off film about Anne Hathaway's Catwoman. Christopher Nolan said that she deserves her own movie, and Hathaway herself even said that she'd happily star in one, but only if Nolan was at the director's seat. However, it was never produced, and probably wasn't even really seriously considered by Warner Brothers. Forest Fire 101 is a Lego YouTuber who I used to watch a ton of as a kid. In fact, I think he might have been the first ever YouTuber I was ever a fan of. I have this weird memory of me constantly refreshing his channel on the day he said that Lego Batman and Indiana Jones Movie 3 was going to be released. He's mostly known for his Lego Batman series, though I'd be lying if I said that the humor in a lot of his videos have aged well. But hey, they hold a very nostalgic place in my heart. Oh, and I, I did lie about something here. He's not most well known for the Lego Batman series. He's most well known for the Duck Song trilogy. Uh, hey, bum bum bum, got any grapes? Batman Judge Dredd, Judgment on Gotham is a graphic novel crossover written by Alan Grant and John Wagner, released in 1991. In this, Judge Death travels to Gotham City and starts doing crime, causing Batman to stop him, obviously. After doing so, he accidentally gets transported to Judge Dredd's universe. There, Dredd arrests him for owning illegal weapons. 
his utility belt, all while back in Gotham, Scarecrow runs loose. Batman and Dread then have to team up to defeat both of their villains. This wasn't the end of the two crossing over, though. It was followed by Batman Judge Dredd, Vendetta in Gotham in 1993, Batman Judge Dredd, The Ultimate Riddle in 1985, and finally the two-parter, Batman Judge Dredd, Die Laughing in 1998. Batman Fights Dracula is a 1967 lost Filipino film that was also about Batman Dracula, released in the 60s. Weird coincidence? Anyways, the film was also not authorized by DC Comics, and is 100% lost outside of some promotional stills. It's thought to be the third installment of the Philippines' own Batman trilogy. It started with 1965's Alas, Batman at Robin, another unauthorized Batman film, but this time a comedy. And its sequel, the 1966 film James Batman, a crossover parody between Batman and James Bond, in which Batman was played by Dolphy, the king of comedy over there in the Philippines. Thankfully, these last two films aren't lost and can be viewed on YouTube. Batman Fights Dracula was also followed up by Fight Batman Fight in 1973, which, uh, I guess that's when Batman just kind of says, you know, fuck it, just starts mowing down people. Alright, real quick, look, I know this is going to annoy some people, but I'm sorry. I despise Jared Leto's take on Joker. And no, I don't think the Snyder Cut saved him. In fact, I think his appearance in Snyder Cut only solidified him as the worst live-action Joker, in my opinion. Anyways, with all being said, there's been a couple of DCU projects involving the Joker that haven't been confirmed to be cancelled. But I mean, let's be real, DC constantly cancelling shit in the DCU. These are probably gone too. These included a Harley Quinn vs. Joker movie, which would have taken comedic inspiration from Bad Santa of all movies, in a standalone Joker film. I cannot imagine a two-hour-long Jared Leto Joker film. From 2011 to 2013, a series of comedy skits were uploaded onto YouTube by College Humor, starring Pete Holmes as Batman. This series was called Batman, and was basically, what if Batman in the Dark Knight trilogy was an idiot? I loved these as a 13-year-old, which, I mean, let's be real here, that's what College Humor's prime demo was, despite its name. But after rewatching all of them for this video, I can't say any of them hold up really well at all. Except these three, especially the Riddler one. Yeah, you're gonna tell Riddles? You shouldn't give away the answer. Totally ruins the fun. Arkham Insurgency was a fake fifth Arkham game that was rumored in 2017 and 2018. It was a sequel to Arkham Origins and would have featured the Court of Owls as the main villains. Who knows, maybe it was legit. I mean, there was content art for a scrapped game that wasn't the Damian Wayne game that was leaked that featured the Court of Owls. Now, Gotham Knights has the Court of Owls as the main villain. Wait, shit, wait, 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 was this legit? Poor Joe Mungaliello. Dude was so excited to be Deathstroke in the DCU. and only got to play with two films. First in 2017's Justice League as a post credit scene. That was supposed to go into Ben Affleck's Batman film, but they also confirmed around the same time that Deathstroke's solo film was also being made, and would have been a prequel. It would have dealt with Deathstroke's time in the military, his connections to League of Shadows, his wife, the death of his son, and a bunch of other stuff. But it was cancelled because Warner Bros. said it wasn't a priority. But then Zack Snyder brought him back in the Snyder Cut to Joe's excitement. And then only filmed about 20 seconds of new footage where he didn't say anything, and just stood around while Joker told Batman he was going to give him a reach around. Okay. Batman Dark Tomorrow is a 2003 GameCube and Xbox video game that was envisioned as being an open-world, faithful, and realistic approach to Batman. However, as development progressed, it had to be scaled back quite a bit. The result? Batman Dark Tomorrow has been described as one of the worst video games ever made. With poor controls, camera issues, and technical issues, the game also featured multiple endings that fucked up the game. You see, in order to get the good ending, Batman must disarm a signal device before facing Ra's al Ghul. But the game never makes it clear to the player to do that, and so most players got one of the three bad endings where Batman fails to save one-third of the world's population. It was so bad that the PlayStation 2 port that was in development got cancelled. So everyone loved the DCAU, right? Batman the Animated Series, Justice League, Superman the Animated Series, Batman Beyond, Static Shock, Justice League Unlimited, etc. Did you know there's been a quite a few projects in the DCAU that have been released, but nobody ever talks about? For example, the Zeta Project, which aired from 2001 to 2002, and got two seasons and was a spin-off to Batman Beyond. Then there's Batman and Harley Quinn from 2017, 
objectively the worst Batman film ever made. And I don't like using the term objectively when talking about art and stuff like that, but this is the worst Batman film. Uh, I will I will debate you on this. That it is. It's the I can make a whole fucking video about how much I hate this movie. Oh, holy. It's not so bad. Smells like discipline. Then in 2019, we got Justice League vs. The Fatal Five, which is a continuation of the Justice League show. Oh, how about the Gotham Girls web series? Yup, a web series from the year 2000. Oh, and the Lobo web series released in 2000 as well. Then of course, there's the comic stuff, and oh, right, right, right. A Batman game is released the same year as Dark Tomorrow called Batman Rise of Sinzu, which featured Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill, aka the definitive Batman and Joker, voicing their respective characters. So Batman Cataclysm is one of the very rare superhero comics that deals with natural disasters. In this case, a 7.6 earthquake hits Gotham City, which results in absolute chaos as inmates escape into the city and Wayne Manor and the Batcave are destroyed. So now Batman, Robin, Catwoman, Huntress, Nightwing, and spoiler, gotta save the city. I honestly wish we got more superhero stories dealing with natural disasters like this. It just makes the world feel more alive. So this is just a really quick one. There was a commercial made to promote Batman Returns and Diet Coke that featured Batman traveling around Gotham City in a Diet Coke outage. When he finally gets one, Catwoman steals it for him. I hope this is canon to the Burden Verse. In 2018, a trailer for the show Titans was released that featured Dick Grayson murdering a bunch of criminals and then saying, Fuck Batman. And instantly the internet took it and began to do what the internet does best laugh at stuff. Now, I've never seen Titans, so I'm not going to say if the show is bad or anything, but this line read is hilariously edgy. You're probably confused why Batman Gotham Knight is on here, and why it's so well on the iceberg. I mean, most Batman fans know about it. It's a compilation film of a bunch of Batman short stories made by anime studios. But what you might not know is that this film was actually meant to be canon to the Dark Knight trilogy, and takes place between Batman Begins and the Dark Knight, and has even been acknowledged by the film's producers. In 1994, a one-shot crossover comic called Batman and Punisher Lake of Fire is released. It's a crossover between Punisher and Batman. Well, as real Batman, because at the time Batman Nightfall was still going on, so Batman's back was still broken. In this comic, Punisher travels to Gotham City to look for Jigsaw and Joker, who are now working together. Because of his whole, I'm gonna kill all criminals motto, Batman comes into conflict with him. A follow-up comic called Punisher and Batman Deadly Knights was released a year later in 1994 but this time featured Bruce Wayne as Batman like normal. Like a lot of early comic book icons, the credit for who created Batman is a bit of a debate. Bob Kane received sole credit and payment for Batman's creation back in the day, so everyone just kind of assumed it was him. But in 2015, DC Comics and War Bros finally agreed to grant Bill Finger co-creator credit for Batman. Who is Bill Finger? Well, Bill wrote for Batman. He invented most of Batman's stuff. And because he was never credited, he died penniless and forgotten in 1974. I would highly recommend the 2017 Hulu documentary, Batman Bill, to see how both Bill Finger and Bob Kane deserve the credit for Batman's creation. DC Special Series issue 27 released in 1981 and featured the story The Monster and the Madman, which featured Batman taking on the Incredible Hulk. In this universe, Bruce Banner is working in a division at Wayne Research trying to create a Gamma Gun to cure diseases. However, Joker comes in and tries to steal the gun. Batman shows up to fight Joker, but it's too late. The attempt at stealing the Gamma Gun has stressed Banner out to the point of him turning into the Hulk. So Batman and Hulk briefly fight while Joker escapes. Joker then uses the Gamma Gun on a villain called the Shaper of Worlds. It's revealed that the Shaper had promised Joker unlimited power once his powers were restored. Through some fights, Batman and Hulk end up confronting both the Shaper and Joker. Shaper then decides to bail and leave Earth and gives Joker's unlimited power to create anything he wants. Batman then challenges Joker to do so, and when he does so, it's too much for him and he goes into a permanent catatonic state. With the Gamma Gun gone and Joker's powers gone, Bruce Banner has lost all hope of ever curing himself. What a bummer ending to such a weird crossover. Gotham Corner Store? Yes, we seem to be down to our last diet cook. A gentleman is on his way to pick some up. 
Just look for a black car. And by the way, the gentleman is usually in quite a rush. Just for the taste of it, Diet Coke. Batman's in a rush, all right. He's already out on video cassette. Catch Batman now at a special low price. Melvin, Brother of the Joker, is a comedy skit uploaded to YouTube on April 12th, 2009, made by Doug Walker, a.k.a. The Nostalgia Critic. See? I told you to talk about him in a bit. An hour later, but still, we talked about him. It's one of the most unfunny videos ever made and has been completely disowned by Doug. Just have a, just watch a bit, all right? Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. Melvin, Melvin, brother of the Joker. I'm cool. Hello, hi, I am Melvin, the brother of the Joker. I'm sure a lot of you haven't heard of me, but uh, I am the brother of, yes, the infamous Joker. You know, why so serious, you know, all that stuff. Uh, actually, I too have been working on my own catchphrase. Um, sploopity splooch. May not be as catchy, but uh, I, I think it works. So, yeah. All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome all the newcomers to my blog. Hello. In Arkham City, you can find pregnancy tests from Harley Quinn that reveal that she's pregnant with Joker's baby. You can even hear Harley Quinn singing Hush Little Baby at the end of the credits. Seems like Rocksteady was planning on the next installment involving the child of the Joker, right? Well, in the DLC, Harley Quinn's Revenge reveals that the results were actually negative. I don't know why they changed this. Maybe it was an abandoned plotline? So Marvel has the Hulkbuster, and it's become pretty iconic. So what if DC said, let's just give Batman a Hulkbuster? Enter the Justice Buster, a mech designed by Batman to defeat the entire Justice League. It's got plasma shields, powdered magnesium carbonate cannons to defeat Aquaman, a Cytron Neuralizer to defeat Green Lantern, the Bind of Veals to defeat Wonder Woman, an Electromagnetic Nerve Tree to defeat Cyborg, and a Frictionless Fluid Cannon to defeat Flash. And of course, a Brass Knuckle-like device that contains Red Suns to defeat Superman. Its only appearance has been in Batman Endgame, and I personally really don't like it. Like, I get why he would want to have this, but it just seems way too much of an obvious Hulkbuster clone. I don't know. They say it's based more on the Dark Knight Returns exo armor he wears, but I think that's a stretch. In the mid-90s, Fox Kids approached Bruce Timm to make a spin-off to Batman the Animated Series based on Catwoman, but the series was scrapped in favor of Superman the Animated Series, most likely because Superman's a more marketable character. In 2003, while working on the third Batman the Animated Series movie, Batman Mystery of the Batwoman, Warner Bros. approached Boyd Kirkland to write and direct a direct-to-DVD Catwoman film to tie in with the 2004 live-action film. It's never been revealed whether or not this film would have been connected to the 2004 film or set in the DCAU. A script was written, but it was ultimately cancelled because, well, Catwoman 2004 was Catwoman 2004. In 1993, it was announced that Michelle Pfeiffer was set to reprise her role as Catwoman in her own solo film. Tim Burton was actually announced as director. Ultimately, though, Tim Burton left the project and the film fell through, most likely because the Burton verse was going in a more family friendly tone, while its Catwoman film, according to Daniel Waters, was going to be extremely dark. In 2010 to 2011, a 13 issue series was released called Batman Odyssey, written by Neil Adams, in which Batman travels to the center of the Earth. Or, well, he claims. It's told in a weird POV shot like those POV animes only psychopaths watch? In this, a shirtless Harry Bruce Wayne tells the story about how he traveled to the center of the Earth, fought dinosaurs, cavemen, Egyptian gods, met some wizards, aliens, rescued Talia al Ghul, etc. Also, the story is told in flashbacks within flashbacks within flashbacks because Neil Adams just decided that's how storytelling works. Oh, and he uses a gun. Shoots a villain called Sensei in front of all of his villains, but don't worry, it was all part of the plan as Batman then gives him some Lazarus Pit formula that turns him into a baby, and then Batman gives baby Sensei up for adoption. 
What the fuck is this comic? I'd go watch Comic Trope's video on this for a more detailed explanation for what really happens in this train wreck. An animated Nightwing series was in development from Ki Hon Ryu, who worked on the Boondocks and Legend of Korra. It got some development done on it, but was ultimately cancelled for Young Justice. Funny enough, Nightwing later showed up in Young Justice later on in the second season. No Man's Land is one of the most iconic Batman comics out there, and there were actually two attempts to get adapting the comic for television. The first was an animated series in the mid-2000s. Designs for the characters were done, but the project was ultimately cancelled by Warner Bros. for being too dark. So instead, they made Brave and the Bold. The second was a CGI animated series, but was scrapped for the same reason the last pitch was. It was just simply too dark for DC at the time. In the 1988 storyline, Death and the Family, Jason's Todd fate was left up to the readers, who would call in to either vote for Jason Todd to live or die. Sadly for Jason, the readers voted to kill him by a tiny margin. Because the choice was left up to the readers, there actually exists pages of an alternate ending that would have been released if fans voted to spare Jason. Since then, there's been two pages of what this issue would have looked like shown to the public. But the issue was never actually completed, so a full release is impossible. So everyone knows about the Batmobile, the Batwing. Uh, no, 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 not that Batwing. That Batwing. The Batboat, the Batcycle, etc. But there's been plenty of other Batman vehicles over the years that have been kind of odd. For example, in the masterpiece that is Batman and Robin, Batman magically has a Bat Skiff. Why does he have this? I have no idea. He also has the Bat Hammer, which is apparently coated in silver ice armor that can reflect ice blasts. Cool. One of the first vehicles he ever had was the Bat Gyro, that somehow made its way to modern day DC Comics. Then there's the Bat Glider, which I'd only imagined was used once before Batman went. Wait, I can just glide with my cape. I don't I don't need this. This one actually appeared in the animated series. And finally, there's the Batarang X, which is literally a giant Batarang Batman rides after catapulting it into the air. Oh, and they're not vehicles, but let's never forget the time Batman had rocket skates in 1958's Batman issue 117. In 2002, work began on a theater production called Batman the Musical. Five songs from the canceled show have been released to the public. Gotham City, Batman Solo, The Graveyard Shift, Joker Solo, Where Does He Get All Those Wonderful Toys, Catwoman Solo, I Need All the Love I Can Get, We're Still the Children We Once Were, and In the Land of the Pig, The Butcher is King, which would have been sung by the corrupt politicians ruling Gotham. Funny enough, that last song was actually covered in the Meatloaf album, Bat Out of Hell 3, The Monsters Loose. But ultimately, this theater production would end up being cancelled. Though, another unrelated Batman musical would be released in 2012 called Holy Musical Batman. In 1967, a seven-minute presentation was created to gauge interest in a possible Batman spin-off series starring Batgirl. However, the presentation didn't do well, so we never got it. You can actually find the presentation on YouTube. In this, Batgirl saves Batman and Robin from Killer Moth, which, funny enough, is Killer Moth's only appearance in the 60s Batman franchise. Craig McCracken said on Tumblr that while working on Powerpuff Girls, he wanted to do an episode where Batman the Animated Series version of Joker crossed over with the Powerpuff Girls. He said, and I quote, When we did the original series, I really wanted to do an episode where the Joker came to town and started committing crimes. The idea was that the mayor was so excited to have a celebrity villain in town that he'd actually tried to thwart the girls from stopping him because the Joker was finally putting Townsville on the map. We wanted to use Bruce Timm's designs for Batman the Animated Series and get Mark Hamill to do the voice. Unfortunately, Warner Brothers said no. In 2017, Jordan Buck Roberts pitched a live-action Red Sun movie to Warner Brothers as an Elseworld DCEU film with different actors playing Batman and Superman but was told no by DC. But later, writer Mark Miller commented on this, saying that two of his friends had been approached by Warner Brothers themselves to direct a live-action Red Sun film. But since the animated adaptation came out in 2020, it looks like this will never happen. And before you comment saying this is a Superman thing, Batman's in Red Sun, look. There he is, right there. There he is! A film adaptation of Brian Azario's Joker graphic novel was considered by DC, but never happened. Probably because there's no way that comic could be adapted. I mean, it could, but I mean, 
That comic is really dark. Arguably the darkest thing DC's done in a long, long time. So Flesher Studios, the guys who made those amazing Superman cartoons in 1941, were going to make some Batman cartoons as well. They began discussing the idea with DC in 1942, and it got to the point where they even began discussing the budget of the cartoons. Sadly, it wasn't meant to be, and the idea was abandoned. It's a real shame, because I, I honestly think those Superman cartoons from 1941 are some of the best pieces of animation ever. They, they're just flawless. In the late 2000s, there were talks of a CG cartoon about Batman and Superman beginning their careers. The plot would have been about Clark and Bruce becoming friends, but Superman and Batman hating each other. They'd eventually find each other's secret identities and end up living in the same building. It would have mostly been a comedy like Brave and the Bold, but ultimately, it wasn't meant to happen as the studio developing this show went on to make Beware the Batman instead. Batman Dark Knight... Dark Knight... What a stupid fucking title. Uh, was a potential sequel to Batman and Robin. It was pitched by Lee Shapiro and Stephen Wise in 1998 and was heavily inspired by The Dark Knight Returns. In this, Bruce would have given up his crime-fighting career and Dick Grayson had begun attending Gotham College. Scarecrow would then show up and conduct fear experiments on Arkham Asylum's patients, accidentally turning Kirk Langstrom into the Man Bat. The people of Gotham then believed that Man Bat was actually Batman. In order to clear his name and solve the mystery of the Man Bat, Bruce takes up the cowl one last time. Sadly, Warner Bros. decided to move forward with the project in 2001, but, you can read the screenplay for it yourself online. Batman Dead End is a fan film released on July 19, 2003, directed by Sandy Kawara. The short tells the story of Batman confronting Joker, but in the middle of said confrontation, a xenomorph from the Alien franchise comes in and kills Joker. Batman then fights off the xenomorphs before battling a predator who arrives shortly after. After defeating the predator, Batman's surrounded by even more predators. Batman then gets ready for the fight of his life as the film ends. It received critical acclaim, and was voted one of the most pivotal moments in fan film history in 2006 by Fan Films Quarterly. Batman Scar of the Bat is a 1996 Elseworld story written by Max Allen Collins, in which Batman is a man named Elliot Ness, who is a federal agent charged with leading a task force to take down Al Capone in Prohibition-era Chicago. After finding it hard to take down criminals restricted by the law, he takes up the mantle of Batman to fight Capone in his own unique way. I really like this bat suit and would love for it to appear in some video games. Oh, and how could I forget? Elliot Ness is a real person. This comic is literally what if Elliot Ness, real life prohibition officer, became Batman. Wild stuff. Alias Batman and Robin is an unauthorized 1981 Filipino musical comedy that spoofs the 60s Batman series. It features several of the Philippines' most popular comedians at the time, like Joey Dilan as Batman, Rene Requitas as Joker, and Pachito Elba as Penguin. Oh, and Wonder Woman was in it for some reason. There was a sequel planned, but it never actually came to be. Elmer Fudd vs. Batman is a one-shot crossover comic between Batman and Looney Tunes written by Tom King. In this gritty take on Looney Tunes, Elmer Fudd confronts Bugs the Bunny for the murder of his sister. Bugs lies and says the Bruce Wayne orb the hit, causing Elmer Fudd to go after Bruce Wayne. After a brutal fight between Batman and Elmer Fudd, the duo confront Bugs when it's revealed that Elmer Fudd's sister was actually alive and had Bugs frame Bruce so that she could start a new life after finding out that her brother is a hitman. The comic ends with Batman, Fudd, and Bugs drinking somberly at the bar as Elmer muses on the inevitability of death. This comic is insanely good for no reason. Do yourself a favor and read it. On Thanksgiving Day 1989, during the Macy's Day Parade, a man dressed up as Joker appeared, played by an unknown actor. He arrived on a float and threw money at the crowd, and then he started to sing in promotion for Batman 1989. Did I mention he also does impressions? Maurice Wood, go ahead and make my dressing. Or Schwarzenegger, hello Batman, I blow you up. Or neighbors, golly! Where does he get those wonderful toys? Batman Dying is Easy is a fan film released on March 10th, 2021, directed by Aaron and Sean Schreck. The film was made on a budget of $77,200 by an Indiegogo campaign in 2020. It's about Batman taking down Mad Hatter and Joker. I won't spoil it for you, since it just came out, and it's really good. I highly recommend watching it. So, who was the first Batwoman? Nope, not her. Not her either, but good guess. Oh, wait. She actually was. Um. Oh, okay, first live action Batwoman. 
1968, a Mexican film titled The Batwoman was released. It's about a superhero named Batwoman investigating a scientist who's kidnapping wrestlers to steal their spinal fluid to create a gill man. Okay. The film is notable for not being authorized by DC and, well, that costume. Or lack of. Batwoman in this is played by Mari Monti and... Now, look, I'll be honest here. I thought this was a porn parody at first, but no. There's no porn. Just Mari Monti wearing almost nothing. How about we play this next hand with the Joker? How about the Joker plays with you? Whoever draws the ace of spades wins the night out! That window. <laughs> Jeremy, mm -hmm. have a Snickers. Why? Because you get a little bit crazy when you're hungry. Better? Better. You're not you when you're hungry. Snickers, don't stop. I want to reshuffle! Regardless, name Detective Blunstrup. I get it. Odd name, but we live in an odd city. I've been living with Gordon Bowie for ages now. Been around the books. Anyways, you want to know if the JCPD thinks all this Bruce Wayne is bad and shit? Sure, I'll tell you. But you don't have to buy me a drink first. Some of the boys over in Austin department are talking about how they think Bruce Wayne killed his mom, pal. It's to that Joe Chill Creek. Yeah, because all that spoiled rich kid shit, you know? That's what they do. There's some cutie detail of a black kid that think that Wayne's brother Alfred's responsible. Yeah, he's a villain behind all this shit. They say that he hanged the poor broken boy into becoming that bad crazed out loo. I don't buy it. But the guy wants a decent dude. What's that a drink, I'll tell you. The guy's done an arc and convinced that Bruce Wayne and Batman. It's a real thing, for sure. Batman's a legit creature. Not like man bat, but like a demon or something. You know about that laughter epidemic back in 62? Or whatever? Well, I ever heard Gordon and Bats talking about how the epidemic fits Joker's M.O. They say he was Joker and the first of his kind, or that Joker's a time traveling clown. We're talking cracks and some idiot on the land should catch with mustard folks and wouldn't surprise me. I've been thinking. You know, Batman always seems to know what Joe was gonna do. Or well, maybe he's gonna get sign me. Tell him about the grips. Shit, that's what I do. But I know this Joker's punching bag queen sometimes fucks around with it for a little too long. But she's stalling for time to us boys and blue all of it. I'm bigger than a pair. She takes the hard job, or he gets the play. Wow, look, this one, off the record. Cash told me last time that I had to go to Arkham, the Clayface of the news. That was three months ago. The bat hasn't found him yet. Some are saying... Some are saying that Gordon couldn't take the pressure and kill himself. He had to deal Clayface to replace him. Think about it. Giving him a stable income, Gordon gets away, go out of jail for life, make a pain with a vicious wife. Not the worst plea bargain. <laughs> Alright, and we're done. Um I just wanna give, I just wanna thank everyone for um watching the Transformers Iceberg. I didn't think it was anyone was gonna watch it. Last time I checked it was 18k. It, it's it's insanity. It's um I'm genuinely shocked. I mean there there are YouTubers I used to I, I watched when I was younger that watched the video and they said, you know, good job, great job and all that. It's meant a lot meant a lot to me. Um you know I said I commented on that video saying, you know, I wasn't gonna do any more icebergs after this one because it's tiring. It is tiring. It's it's is tiring but some people were like oh no come on you make more content and then, so i will i'll do a couple more icebergs do a couple more icebergs i, I want to do other stuff too um 
but yeah, the, the, there will be more icebergs. The next one I'm working on will be out within May, sometime in May. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for. I'm not going to tell you what it is because then someone might make one, <laughs> uh, make the one I'm thinking of making, and uh, destroy it. Uh, so yeah, that being said, um, th- thank you. If you were, if you watched this to the end, thank you. This was a lot of fun to make. Um, it was stressful, really, but not stress. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it took a lot of time to make. I'll say that. Um, but the, uh, the last commissioner part, like the, uh, detective part was, I thought it was pretty funny. I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I had to re-record it because the first voice just kind of didn't work. But, uh, yeah. Uh, so anyways, yeah, this is the longest outro I've done. I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, have a great day, night, whatever. Uh, just have fun. Have fun with life. All right. And I'll uh, see you next time. You cannot make this up, but a toad and a mouse are friends at AutoZone. <laughs>